are going to perform a series of physical examination on a pediatric patient. Head circumference is taken during the first two years of life, but measurement can be useful at any age to assess growth of the head. The head circumference in infants reflects the rate of growth of the cranium in the brain. Normally, the head circumference at birth is around 35 centimeters. Small head size result from premature closure of the sutures or microcephaly which may be familial or due to chromosomal abnormalities. Large head size is macrocephaly which may result from hydrocephalus, subdural hematoma, or rare causes. To measure the head circumference, place your measuring tape over the occipital, parietal, and frontal prominences to obtain the maximum circumference. Measuring the length and height. Length or recumbent height is the measure of a baby when lying down in supine position. It is used from birth to 24 months as it is common to have lordosis in this age. To measure the baby's length and height, the parent or assistant holds the infant's head against a headboard. The legs are held straight by grasping the knees with the feet flat against the footpiece. On the other hand, Height is a vertical measurement or a record of an upright position. To begin blood pressure measurement, use a properly sized blood pressure cuff. The length of the cuff's bladder should be at least equal to 80% of the circumference of the upper arm. Wrap the cuff around the upper arm with the cuff's lower edge 1 inch above the antecubital fossa. PP measurement is important for high-risk infants and should be routinely performed in greater than or equal to 3 years old. You will need your skills in distraction and play. It is important to choose the correct spigmo manometer cuff in measuring a pediatric patient's blood pressure. Same with the adults, the cuff should cover two-thirds of the patient's arm. The cuff measurement varies on the patient's age. Lightly press the stethoscope's diaphragm over the brachial artery just below the cuff's edge. Rapidly inflate the cuff and then release air from the cuff at a moderate rate. Listen with the stethoscope and simultaneously observe the sphygmomanometer. The first knocking sound is the subject's systolic pressure and when the knocking sound disappears, that is the diastolic pressure. Palpation of pulses in an infant. The average heart rate of children are as follows. 90 to 190 beats per minute upon birth. 80 to 180 beats per minute for children between 0 to 6 months. 75 to 155 beats per minute for children between 6 to 12 months. The pulse of an infant can be examined by palpating the areas of the femoral arteries, temporal arteries, and brachial arteries, and the heart. The carotid arteries are not examined due to the fragility of infants. The femoral arteries are located between the iliac crest and the symphysis pubis. To palpate the artery, flex the thighs of the patient towards the abdomen. Decreased femoral pulse may indicate coarctation of the aorta. Similarly, an even pulse of both upper and lower extremities may suggest a coarctation of the aorta. If the pulses seem weak, it may indicate myocardial infarction or heart failure. The temporal arteries may also be palpated anterior to the ears. Brachial artery can be palpated in the antecubital fossa. The chest may also be palpated and auscultated. Presence of pulsations near the area may suggest increased metabolic rate or inefficient pumping. Additionally, check for heaves and thrills. Heaves indicate increased ventricular contraction and thrills indicate turbulence within the heart or great vessels. Inspection of the mouth and pharynx is usually best done while the child is crying. Use a flashlight in inspection and palpation. No teeth will be observed, but will notice small pearl-like cysts called epistein pearls along the alveolar ridge or centrally on the hard palate.
These are normal in newborns and tends to disappear in one to two months. You will see that the newborn's mouth is edontulous and the alveolar mucosa is smooth with finely serrated borders. Petechiae is also common on the soft palate among newborns. A tongue's whitish covering can also be observed. If caused by milk, this will easily be removed or scraped. If not, it could be a thrush. Thrush, which is commonly seen in gingival surfaces and buckle. When examining the pharynx, use of tongue blade would be difficult as it produces a strong gag reflex. Do not expect to visualize the tonsils. The physical examination of the skin comprises of inspection and palpation. First is to inspect the color. Look for hyperpigmentations and hypopigmentations of the skin. You may also look for the redness and paleness all over the patient's body. Do not forget to take note if the patient has cyanosis which indicates low oxygen levels in the red blood cell. Inspect any lesions of the skin and note its anatomic location and distribution together with its characteristics. Skin lesion findings of the newborn that must be noted are Cutis marmorata Acrocyanosis Harlequin dyschromia Mongolian spots Milia Miliaria rubra and Physiologic jaundice You may inspect the moisture of the skin Take note if there are any dryness, oiliness, or sweating, and also the texture if it is rough or smooth. You may assess the patient's temperature by using the backs of your fingers. Note the temperature of any red areas. On checking for the mobility, lift a fold of the patient's skin and note the ease with which it lifts up, while turgor is the speed with which it returns in place. Doing an otoscopic examination of a child. First, have the child sit in the parent's lap or lie down on their side, back, or abdomen with the ear to be examined facing upwards. If lying down, have the parent hold the arms either extended or close to the sides to limit motion. If sitting, place the child's legs between the parent's legs and have the parent place one arm around the child's body and use the other hand to hold the child's head firmly against the parent's chest. Grasp the auricle with your thumb and forefinger of your non-dominant hand and pull to straighten the canal. The external auditory canal curves upward in infants so pull down and back to the 6 to 9 o'clock range. The external auditory canal curves downward and forward in children greater than 3 years of age so pull up and back toward a 10 o'clock position. Insert the speculum into the meatus between the 3 and 9 o'clock positions in a downward and forward position no more than 0.23 to 0.5 inches in older children. In neonates and infants, the 2 mm speculum may need to be inserted deeper due to the underdeveloped cartilaginous and bony structures. Brace your hand against the patient's temple or cheek using your fourth and fifth fingers to stabilize the otoscope and guard against trauma with sudden movements. Direct the speculum in a slightly downward fashion as you insert it into the external auditory canal approximately 0.25 to 0.5 inches. Remove cerumen discharge, debris, or foreign bodies if inhibiting direct visualization of the tympanic membrane. Inspect the walls of the external auditory canal. Carefully move the speculum to see as much of the tympanic membrane as possible. Inspect the tympanic membrane for color, translucency, vascularity, and position. Identify the umbo, manubrium of the malleus, the light reflex, the pars flaccida, and the pars tensa. Use a pneumatic otoscope to assess the tympanic membrane's mobility. Insert the pneumatic otoscope into the air canal and ensure an airtight seal. Failure to obtain a seal can produce a false positive or lack of movement finding. Squeeze the bulb to introduce air into the canal, being careful not to apply excessive pneumatic pressure. The tympanic membrane and its light reflex should move inward. Release the bulb to remove air. The tympanic membrane should move outward. 
Examination of the neck. Inspect the neck of the infant while noting for color, symmetry, presence of mass, lesions, or signs of trauma. Have the patient in a supine position and palpate for the lymph nodes. Note for masses, congenital cysts such as branchial cleft cysts, preauricular cysts and sinuses that may often lead to hearing deficits, thyroglossal duct cysts, congenital torticollis or rear neck. Don't forget to check for the position of the thyroid cartilage and trachea. It should be centrally located between C4 and C5. Look for evidence of fractures in the clavicles which may occur during delivery. Examination of the nose and sinuses. Inspect the area of the nose. Note for symmetry and presence of masses. Test the patency of nasal passages by gently including one of the nostrils while holding the infant's mouth. If there is an obstruction, it may indicate coenal atresia. Repeat the procedure for the other nostril. Check if the nasal septum is midline. Insert the nasal speculum and check the internal mucosa. The sinuses of the infant are not fully developed aside from the ethmoid sinus. Therefore, palpation of the sinuses are not entirely helpful. Thank you for watching our video. I hope you've learned a lot.